This is Brand USA Talks Travel, elevating the conversation about international travel to the United States. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. Word on the street is that you've been dubbed the boss in the Bay Area. How did you get that nickname? <laughs> I don't know where you're getting your word on the street from. Uh, I have my spies. <laughs> I think there are a few contenders for that title in the Bay Area that probably would outmatch me. I would settle for the Brit in the Bay Area or a <laughs> Brit in the Bay Area. It's great to be joined by Henry Calling, Chief Innovation Officer at Media Monk San Francisco. Henry has created viral campaigns. This is what my copy says, Henry. Viral campaigns. I'd like to meet the individual that actually really, truly created a viral campaign. You never it's know it's viral to. until it goes viral. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't intended to be viral. It just had the good fortune to go that way. Well, it says you created viral campaigns and cutting-edge virtual experiences for over 20 years. Henry has been profiled by The Economist. Wow, that's a big one. And his work has been exhibited by Banksy. So Henry, a lot of people are focused on the future of AI, and you and I talked just a few weeks ago, and I asked you to be on the podcast for a reason, because from that conversation that I had with you, it seems to me that you're already focused on AI right now in the marketing space, not in the future, but like right at this moment. I'll start with the really big question. Can AI create better content than a human being already? <laughs> All right. You're getting me in trouble with the very first question. So I have a fairly bullish opinion, and I need to caveat my response by saying I'm on the bullish end of the spectrum when it comes to AI and its application to the creative industry. So I'm going to answer yes. I think AI manifestly can do pieces and parts of the creative and craft process better than humans. And I don't mean better necessarily in terms of the quality of the output, but certainly better in terms of the speed and the scale and the consistency and fidelity that you're able to get from artificial intelligence. It's not the end-to-end -end workflow. We're a long way from a magic button that's going to do the whole marketing process, even the creative parts of that process. But the conversation I have with a lot of folks when we talk about creativity and artificial intelligence is they say, okay, but it's just doing the craft piece. It's just doing the image generation piece. And I think the part of it that people don't understand is that actually the LLMs today are able to do idea generation. Um, they're able to actually come up with the concepts of creative work, specifically creative campaign work in a way that's actually really effective. Like we're looking at research where I think it's the most recent version of ChatGPT4 is scoring in the top 1% for the Torrance test, which is a academically accepted, as far as I understand the space anyway, an academically accepted test for general creativity. And then they're repeatedly scoring in the very, very top tiers of those. So they're not better than all humans, like the very best creative humans, but they're better than most humans, or they're right up there by how we measure creativity, which obviously is a hard thing to measure. One of the things that really bugs me about the way people look at AI is that they feel like it's done already. Don't realize that we're literally 45 seconds into this journey. It was like being at the beginning of the internet in 1993, and people would complain about the things that didn't work. It's like, come on, we don't even have broadband yet. Are you kidding me? Like, we're at the dawn of this. A hundred percent, and it's moving incredibly fast. What workflows are you using already? So we've been going through this sort of realization about what AI is doing to our industry over the past year, right? That's been the story of the last year of my life is like, oh, the penny dropped. This is going to mean sweeping disruption. This is effectively the new internet for creative services or marketing services. Um, since that moment, which I think we got to ahead of many people in our space, some of them still aren't quite there. We've been on a mission to transform, to sort of become the most AI enabled player in our space. So when it comes to the workflows that we're doing, we're literally mapping every single task that we do in our organization for our clients across data, media, content creation, and technology. So Henry, give me a couple of concrete examples so people can really understand this. Yeah, no, of course. I guess the most obvious ones that spring to mind would be copywriting and photography, but also the slightly more esoteric parts of the process like media mix modeling. You can do a lot with AI to speed up the process of media mix modeling. So like, whereas building a model might previously take weeks or months and then and the bugbear is it's out of date by the time you have the model of your media mix. Because of AI, we're able to speed that process up a lot more. You're talking about media placement here, right? Yeah, and understanding the levers of growth from the channels where you're going to market. 
is that both on the front end and the back end of media placement? In other words, you use it to place the media and then you analyze it as it's running? That's on the back end in terms of the analysis of like what's performing in the channels where you're running. But we're also looking specifically at like media execution and the kind of bread and butter tasks like trafficking and labeling and media execution, but even also media planning. There are so many different applications for artificial intelligence at every piece and part of the overall marketing puzzle. There's no single productized solution yet for the enterprise marketer. So we're at a stage where we're doing that work of basically productizing the solution. We're building the workflows, we're building the pipelines, and we're tailoring them to the needs of marketers. You mentioned photography and copy, so could you tell me a little bit more about that and how it scales? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think anyone listening to this podcast will be quite aware of what AI is able to do in the image generation and and copy generation space. I don't know. I wouldn't take that for granted. Go ahead. Dumb it down a little bit. Dumb it down for me. When I look at what you're able to generate with AI image generators or the copy that you're able to generate with large language models, it's manifestly of a standard that is easy easily good enough for basically most marketing purposes. I don't want to set the bar too low for marketers, but we're not making fine art here, right? We're not making cultural artifacts that people are going to spend. So you're talking about banner ads, things like that? I'm talking about banner ads. I'm talking about CRM. Again, I don't want to talk down on those areas of our industry, but they're considered the bread and butter tasks of digital marketing. But we're also getting into whole new levels of experience in digital spaces that you couldn't have before. Like what we're saying with AI is it's allowing us to create the experiences that we've always imagined. One of the examples is we made a piece of work with Spotify where users could have a conversation with the artist The Weeknd and he would actually suggest songs obviously from his own catalog or songs based on the data the listening history of the person talking to him and he would do it in his own tone of voice and you could have sort of a real time it's an AI posing as The Weeknd with his voice right exactly so we're getting into that level of fidelity and the type of digital experience that we're able to create which I think is incredibly exciting I think there's a lot of excitement around the efficiencies that AI is able to generate, but also around the experiences that we're able to build now. How are we going to stop all the hoaxing? I mean, we're coming up on a political season here. I guess it's already started and I haven't noticed it yet, but I'm sure it's out there already. Yeah, I think everyone is standing by and waiting for this to be the tsunami of misinformation that's going to be unleashed around the election. I do have one point of view on that, which is I think as brands or as marketers, we have a specific role in the cultural discourse and we show up in specific ways. And I think this is an opportunity for marketers to act ethically in that regard. Like in many ways, we do have the opportunity to create like content at a scale that's never been imaginable before and tell stories in a way that's never been done before. But how we do it is going to affect the quality of the media landscape that we all live in. And we're all professionals in this space. And I think the way that brands and marketers act today, they go going to be judged on as we're moving into this new space where our information scape is going to look radically different from how it has looked in the last five or ten years. Wow, we suddenly got really heavy, didn't we, Henry? You're the one who went there with me. I know, I went there. It sounds like a job almost for the American Marketing Association or somebody that actually has some national clout. Well, if if you sit on that organization, then please invite me to it. (laughs) No chance they're going to ask me. It sounds like it would take a consortium of people to do what you're suggesting. This is not something one agency or one entity can bite off. Yeah, and I think this is sort of the stage that we're at in our industry. And the conversation you and I are having really is part of that right now, where this is one of many thousands of conversations and panels and discussions and presentations that are happening where we try to understand collectively what are the best practices around using this technology and what are the social mores that we're going to bring to bear okay let's jump over to data we talked about data the last time you and i met talk to data what does that mean you use that and i was looking at my notes after our conversation and i had no idea what you were getting at with that yeah we have this expression talk to your data when we're describing the opportunity and the vision around ai it's no surprise to say right a lot of organizations struggle with managing their data struggle with like distributing access to their data across the organization it showed up in multiple different tech stacks it shows up in ways that are siloed it's hard to access it and it's hard to get the value from it i think the opportunity with ai one of the things that AI is actually manifestly so good at is understanding large structured and unstructured data sets and passing that into language that human beings can understand. So I don't know if you were following Meta Connect, but Meta just announced, I think it was a couple of days ago, that they're releasing new next generation AI chatbots, right? It's part of their foray into AI. 
and they've released a whole host of chatbots that have the point of view and the tone of voice of different celebrities. So there's a Snoop Dogg one, there's a Kendall Jenner one, there's something like 25 or 26 of these different celebrity chatbots. But the point is, a bit like I was saying about our work with The Weeknd, you can now have a conversation with those chatbots and they will respond like Snoop Dogg would respond and it feels like a human conversation. So it's not in any way a big leap of the imagination to apply that same use case to marketers. We can build conversations conversational chatbots that are trained on your personas, right? On your first party data, on third party data, on social cultural listening that's segmented by your persona so you can actually have access to a focus group effectively of your marketing personas that's accessible to anybody in your organization at any time in a way that wouldn't physically be possible with real focus groups. And you can have a natural language conversation with them to garner insights when you're writing your briefs um, or even to like run Creative Spy, right, for pre-launch testing. I love the idea of having an AI focus group, but how would that work exactly? Well, okay, to be fair, this is a little more the level of vision right now, but I work in innovation, so it's important, I think, that we keep eyes on the prize of where we can reasonably get to. But you can train a large language model based on data inputs, right? So you can train it on the data that you have for your customers, how they interact, what campaigns they actually engage with, do they convert, where do they convert, what stage in the journey do they convert. This is the persona information that we already have and that we already use every day as marketers. The problem is it's a sprawling amount of data. And there's a lot of friction involved in actually getting the value from that data and garnering the insights from that data. So typically, you'd go through a whole process of modeling or data science or what have you to get some meaningful value that you can craft a campaign insight around. If you're able to train an LLM based on those data sets, you can have a human conversation with it. You can talk to your data. Oh, okay. I'm finally getting it now. I'm getting it now. That's how you talk to your data. Yeah. <laughs> For destination marketing organizations, and obviously we're the national one, a lot of us struggle with the data because we, again, have so much of it. How do we start in this? You're laying out the long-term picture, but you know one of the things I want to talk about in this podcast is obviously what's going on right now. So right now, how do we start to activate on what it is you're saying? What part of the conversation around data is it tends to feel like a very large problem and very complex. And I don't think it needs to be. And it is obviously going to depend on the size of your organization. I think it can start when we're having conversations around data, we tend to value fresh data, right? We describe like streams of fresh data that you get from designing your campaigns or designing your touch points experimentally are actually more valuable than large, stale potentially like ethically questionable data sets, like large, massive scale data sets or data lakes. You can designing your actual kind of creative outputs with the intent to learn. So designing to learn, you can do like the 80-20 thing, right? You can get 80% of the benefit with 20% of the impact. It's a quick win for your organization that can get you on the way to data maturity. And the shift that we're making now, obviously, in the age of AI is it's not just designing to learn anymore, it's designing to machine learn. So as you design your campaigns and your touch points sort of experimentally and you're testing different hypotheses about what's going to drive engagement, you're again feeding that data back into the model that's becoming smarter and smarter the more that you feed it. While I'm digesting that, let me take a left turn here and talk about something a lot simpler, writing marketing briefs. Because all of us in this industry are constantly writing marketing briefs. So you mentioned to me that you've already got AI doing that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, I think there are several levels at which you can have AI assist with your marketing brief, right? Like the easiest entry, most obvious one, and again, I'd be surprised if many of your listeners weren't already doing this, is just to use it as a copywriting co-pilot, right? So that's already taking out a lot of the grunt work of crafting the right brief. I think where it gets smarter and where it gets to a real scaled solution is a bit like I was describing, when you're feeding your foundation AI with the results from the campaigns that you're putting out in the world, so that it has a clearer view on the personas that you're targeting. It has a clearer view on what's working and what's not working. And that's kept up to date by constant stream of data going back into it. Then it becomes a genuine partner in crafting the brief. Then it becomes more like what I was describing around talking to your data, where you can prompt it with what it is you want to achieve from a campaign. For example, we want to drive awareness of a particular destination at a particular time of year, and it will draft a creative brief for you or a general marketing brief. And then you become more like quality assurance on those briefs. You're the human in the loop that's making sure that this is not a hallucination. This is something that's actually going to be applicable, but the whole process speeds up because of it and becomes, frankly, more efficient because of it. 
Everyone takes a ton of photos on vacation, and you've got an idea of how prior vacation photos can help building the next vacation. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, so this is my pitch to any destination marketer that is listening to this podcast. Everyone knows the experience. You're scrolling through your phone, looking over the catalog of photos that you took on your last vacation. I've got something like 200 from the most recent one that I took. We're at a stage with the technology where it's very reasonable that we could, as a user, you could upload a small subset of those photos to a chatbot that lives on a web page and ask it to generate your family vacation photographs as though you were going on holiday in a place you've never visited before. So say you work for the marketing board for Hawaii. Let's say you do. Yeah, that would be good. Hawaii's in the United States. Hawaii is a place I've never been to, but I've always wanted to go, right? Say I'm trying to pitch the idea to my wife that we should take our next family vacation in Hawaii. I could show her the photos of her and myself and our kids on the beaches in Hawaii, and they would look photo real, right? Like to all intents and purposes, they would be indistinguishable from reality. And that's where we are now with the technology. We could build that today. So if anyone's listening and they want to do that, get in touch with me. That's my pitch. And we'll give Henry's contact information out at the end of the podcast. Share a project or two that you've worked on that you're most proud of. There's been a few in the last six months. And to be perfectly honest about my role in the organization, I get to touch projects less. I'm I'm more of a cheerleader now for the teams that are doing them. But the one that we just produced with the NEP, which is the Japanese Broadcasting Board, where we actually created a character, right? What we're calling a virtual human or a meta human, where it's a real time 3D lady who is able to do sign language. She can do sign language in three different languages. I think it's ASL, International Sign Language and Japanese Sign Language. Oh, this is that Kiki thing you were telling me about. Oh yeah, sorry. So she's called Kiki. And the interesting innovation there is when breaking news happens, it's hard to muster the resources and marshal the resources to be able to like make the news accessible to everybody that's watching it, right? So the people that tend to be left off the list until last are people who are hard of hearing. They're one of the subsets of people who tend to be excluded from that conversation. And now with Kiki, she's a character that can be overlaid on top of a broadcast that will do sign language in real time based on what's being spoken. So it could be a live broadcast and she'll be able to sign along in real time as the live broadcast broadcast is happening. What that means is, A, it's much more efficient for the broadcaster in question to be able to like include those audiences and frankly, from a business point of view, broaden their audience. But for the end user, it means they can take part in a cultural conversation that they were previously excluded from, or at least their entry into it was delayed until human signers could be brought to bear. I have a friend who does this for a living. She's going to be both thrilled and probably scared, maybe, that this is out there. Probably a little bit of both, and that's how we're all going to have to face this. When we're talking about AI, I mean, it's come up a few times in this conversation, but it's this exciting and slightly potent blend of excitement and anxiety. They're there in equal measure. Like I've spent 20 years of my career being a creative in marketing, like as a copywriter, as a creative director before moving into my current role. And a lot of the tasks I came up doing, they're not going to be human beings doing those tasks anymore. Does that mean that work is ended? No, a long way from it. Does that mean marketing is is a done deal now? I think we're very, very far from that. I lean more on the excitement end of the spectrum because I think this opens up new possibilities for new types of experience and ways of engaging with people. There's going to be work for us to do for years and years to come. And that, that includes your friend, I'm sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hopefully it includes both of us as well. I hope so. I, I got to pay for my kids' education. <laughs> Before we go, Henry, I'd like to find out how you stay on top of the latest tech. Obviously, you know a lot about this. So what do you read? What do you listen to? What do you watch? Give us all some tips. I have the opportunity in the role that I'm in. Basically, I talk every day to the most tech forward marketers in the space. Why? Because that's the kind of company that Media Monks is. And those are the conversations that we get brought into most often. I have the good fortune to have this incredible knowledge base of talking to senior marketers in enterprise roles that are very tech focused or very innovation focused. And I garner so many insights from talking with them. And then equally inside of our organization, because we're just very digital native, we're just very tech forward. It's the DNA of our company. We have a or 9,000 people who are just enthused by this stuff. The message boards inside of Media Monks are basically constantly lit up with the latest trends. I have a smorgasbord of that sort of insight available to me, but I know that's 
not necessarily useful to your users. So apologies for ducking the question there. <laughs> is there anything in the greater outside world that us normal human beings can access? <laughs> I'm sure this won't be news to your listeners, but I'm a huge fan of Benedict Evans. He's an analyst. He has a newsletter. He has a website. And every year he does sort of a grand narrative presentation on where he thinks the industry generally is going and what the most important trends are. And I just, if there's one recommendation I recommend Benedict Evans. I think he's one of the most insightful commenters in our space. Give me one more before we go. Any more, you have to pay me a consultancy fee. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, give us the contact information because I'm sure there are going to be folks listening that do want to get in touch with you. Sure. Just uh, hit me up. It's Henry, H-E-N-R-Y, at MediaMonks.com. Henry at MediaMonks.com. That's it, folks. Henry, thanks so much for joining me on Brand USA Talk Travel. Thanks, Mark. It's been great to be here. And that's it for today. We hope you'll either rate or say something about us on your favorite podcast platform. That's Brand USA Talks Travel. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. Your feedback is welcome. Email us at podcast at thebrandusa.com or call 202-793-6256. Brand USA Talks Travel is produced by Asher Mirovich, who also composes music and sound. Engineering by Brian Watkins. With extra help from Bernie Lucas. Dante Karyoki. Keith and Casey D'Ambra. Please share this podcast with your friends in the travel industry. You may also enjoy many of our archived episodes, which you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Safe travels.